Rocks the wind and the clear this dawn. Blows the clouds, he'll start go the earth be. But there's me and a rock wind blowing through the great glen of the world the day. It's a thought that we gather rottens all the rocks that gangal us fresh and gay. Tuck the road and seek other loanings where your employees stay sport and play. Scotland has a long-standing history of going its own road, of leaning left toward the benefit of society and not the benefit of the rich or the landowners. It is no wonder, then, that the Labour Party's beginnings were in 1900 Scotland, rising out of the trade union movement and socialist political parties of the late 1800s. The Labour Party gave a voice to the working class poor in Scotland and spread quickly to stand for the disadvantaged workers all over the UK. It was founded by a lay preacher, Keir Hardy, whose empathy for the struggles of the poor is legendary, whose caring for people over corporations is undeniable. However, in light of the developments during the referendum and since, with Labour upholding and backing Tory policies, and with Gordon Brown's infamous vow not being delivered, a question needs to be asked. Is Labour really the Labour Party of Keir Hardy? Let's hear what a long-time Labour voter says about it. I was a third-generation card-carrying Labour Party member. I might even be fourth generation, I don't know. My great-grandfather was a mine worker, so probably. But his chest was crushed in a mining accident when my dad was a child, so I can't be sure. Dad watched his grandfather die of his injuries on the settee at home. It was in the 1930s before Labour started the NHS, and all his fellow mine workers could do was put him on the back of a cart and push him home to die. The family couldn't afford treatment. His employers didn't care. There was no employee protection then. My dad never forgot seeing that. His dad, my granddad, was a miner too. Granddad lost his job in the 30s and with a friend cycled from Durham to London to find work to support his family. That was in the days before Labour introduced welfare support and child benefit. Like many of his generation, my dad saw a lot of hardships. I think it's what led him to becoming a socialist. He was an active shop steward in the London docks and fought for workers' rights. His sister, my aunt, was also a union activist. She took part in the Dagnum Ford machinist strike for equal pay for women, the strike that led to the Equal Pay Act under Labour. She benefited so many in this generation by standing firm through that tough time. With that background, it's no surprise that I joined the Labour Party. My dad took me along to a local branch in Pennycook when I was 13 to help stuff envelopes. I'd heard all about how Keir Hardy fought for the workers how Labour had stood solidly for the people and their rights so kids wouldn't have to watch their grandfathers die at home from pit injuries. My family's story is nothing unusual. Get any older person talking and you'll hear the same thing about how it was before Keir Hardy. How Labour was born of the working people and how ordinary people stood with them, the party of social justice, to fight the oppression of the Tories, the party of the rich. They will tell you how Labour supported William Beveridge's recommendations to fight against the five evils in society. Squalor, ignorance, want, idleness and disease. Labour brought in social progress innovations on national insurance, education, housing and the NHS to deal with those evils. I was committed to Labour. I was Labour forever, or so I thought. I was wrong. I thought Labour would always be the party of Keir Hardy, the party of the people and of social justice. I could never have imagined that they would walk hand in hand with Thatcher's Tories. How dare Labour betray us and take part in the destruction of the NHS that our parents and grandparents fought for? How dare they sign up to sanction the disabled, the mentally ill and those in need? 
Labour politicians are now millionaires, paying lip service to the people as they change their colours from red to blue. With my family history of fighting for social justice, I had no option. I had to tear up my Labour Party membership card. Labour are no longer my party, or the party my dad and granddad supported. Instead, the SNP, Greens and SSP are the ones fighting for us. It is they, not Labour, who care about housing, jobs and the NHS. I took the final step on 23rd of November 2014 and joined the SNP. The Labour Party have announced that they will follow the Tory policy of cuts and austerity. Not if I have anything to do with it, they won't. In 2015, Jeremy Corbyn rode a tide of desire for change into the Labour front bench. Since then, he has made many errors that spell a disaster for Scotland, if Scotland remains in the Union. These are mainly due to the juggling act Corbyn has tried to achieve between the widening and disparate needs of Scotland and the rest of the UK. This bobbling back and forth has done Jeremy Corbyn no favours in the eyes of Scots. During his last visit in August of 2017, contrary to reports to him of Labour's rebounding in Scotland, the dismal attendance at his personal rallies was rather embarrassing. It was certainly an interesting fact that Kezia Dugdale resigned only six days after Corbyn's failed visit to Scotland to cheer on the masses that didn't show. Well, if a referendum is held, then it, it's absolutely fine. It, it should be held. It's not, I don't think it's the job of Westminster or the Labour Party to prevent people holding referenda. An example of Corbyn's wobbling back and forth, trying to please all while pleasing none, was evident in his two-day turnaround on the independence referendum. At first, on the 11th of March 2017, he said there was no problem if there was another independence referendum. Kezia Dugdale, then still Scottish Labour leader, and Jackie Bailey expressed their disapproval. And then two days later, on the 13th of March, he claimed it was a mischievous misreporting. His taped original interview and then his denial is one of the quickest turnabouts in UK politics. And it was not only on Scotland's independence referendum that Corbyn found himself backtracking time and again. First, in August of 2015, the Labour leader stated that there should be no more peer appointments and that the upper chamber should be elected. Then, in January of 2018, he apparently changed his mind and will be nominating Labour candidates to the House of Lords. The topic of the Trident nuclear missile is another important subject on which Corbyn appears not to have a firm opinion. In three succeeding months, the Labour leader has said he wanted to scrap Trident. Then, with pressure from the Shadow Cabinet, declared that Labour was committed to the nuclear deterrent. According to Michael Evis, the founder of the Glastonbury Festival, Corbyn told him he plans to scrap Trident as soon as possible. Mary Black, MP, speaking at the SNP conference in 2017, summed up the way many feel about Mr Corbyn's lack of credible position when supposedly opposing the Conservative government's austerity programme. And I know that most people in this room would probably agree with me when I say that Jeremy, and Cor Jeremy Corbyn and I act actively agree on quite a lot of things, which is why I hope what I'm about to say is taken with the sincerity with which it's intended. I am so disappointed with Jeremy Corbyn. So disappointed. Yes, he may be an opponent, but I was heartened to see Jeremy Corbyn elected as leader of the Labour Party because I thought finally someone normal and sensible to work with in London. But instead, we've got more of the same London spin and nothing more than talking a good game. 
If you're going to call for an end to austerity, don't release a manifesto scrapping only £2 billion out of a total £9 billion worth of planned Tory cuts. Don't tell the vulnerable that you're fighting for them while you choose to keep 78% of Tory cuts. Don't tell young people that you'll scrap tuition fees but then turn a blind eye to Labour who hike them up in Wales. Don't tell us you're different and then still sign up to waste billions of pounds in nuclear weapons. Corbyn wasn't the first Labour leader to twist facts. Labour's distorting of facts, if not outright lying, started with Tony Blair's new Labour in 1995. In his opening speech, he proclaimed that there will be an end to zero-hour contracts. But despite Blair's promise, Labour became one of the worst offenders, employing one in ten of staff through zero-hours contracts usage. Over the following two decades, Labour has used and still uses zero-hour contracts for many of its staff employees. Richard Leonard, Labour's new branch manager for Scotland, is no different, it seems, than his party leader, Jeremy Corbyn. On Saturday, the 20th of January, Labour and trade union activists will be out in communities right across Scotland, making the case for real and radical economic change. We can't go on with an economy riven with insecure employment. Too many people on zero hours contracts. Too many people on zero hours contracts. Too many people on zero hours contracts. He makes statements that have no basis in evidence, or he twists facts to suit his agenda. He has made grandiose statements that just do not follow the facts on things like zero-hour contracts and the attractiveness of labour for young voters. Recently, Leonard spoke out in Holyrood and was soundly answered by First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. First Minister. <laughs> I say I never thought I'd see Richard Leonard beaming at all of the applause he's getting from his friends on the Tory benches. Do you know what? It is right. Richard Leonard is right on one thing. Scotland's growth rate is not yet matching that of other small independent countries. I wonder why that is. So if Richard Leonard wants to join me in supporting Scotland becoming a small, independent, successful country, then I will welcome its conversion. But let's get back. But let's get back reality. Right now in Scotland, the unemployment rate is close to an all-time low. The employment rate is close to an all-time high. Richard Leonard mentioned business research uh, and development. We've now seen that exceed a billion pounds for the first time. Growth in business research and development is outstripping that across the rest of the UK. Uh, we've closed the productivity cap with the rest of the UK, but yes, now need to close it with our other European uh, competitors as well. And that is why the budget that Derek Mackay outlined uh, last week uh, had so many initiatives in it to support economic growth, from uh, the initiatives on business rates to make sure we're the most competitive part of the UK uh, on business rates, uh, to capitalise a new national investment bank, to increase even further investment in research and development. Now, if Richard Leonard uh, doesn't think all of that goes far enough, then here's an invitation uh, to him. Between now and the next stage of the budget, Richard Leonard and Labour uh, should come forward and tell us what further investments they want us to make in the economy. Uh, that would be a novelty for the Scottish Labour Party. Richard Leonard, the people of Scotland demand 
real, radical and urgent change to her economic strategy. Let me just try and perhaps insert a few facts into the debate we're having. Firstly, the last Labour administration gave Amazon uh, more money uh, than this administration has done, fact one. Fact two, uh, Richard Leonard has talked about RBS and Airdrie Savings Banks, uh, important institutions, but has it really escaped Richard Leonard's notice that just like regulation of employment and most of the macro powers over the economy, Banking regulation is reserved to the United Kingdom government. It is not a responsibility of the Scottish government. It Has it also escaped Richard Leonard's notice that the unemployment rate in Scotland right now is not just close to a record low, it's actually lower than it is in uh, the rest of the UK. And Richard Leonard, uh, Richard Leonard is shaking his head. At the that is actually uh, a matter of basic fact that perhaps he might care to research before he next comes to this chamber. But, you know, despite the limited powers uh, that we have over uh, matters related to the economy, this is a government that does always stand up for workers. Ask the workers at DL, for example, yeah. that wouldn't be in a job right now without the intervention of this government. Ask the workers at Ferguson's shipyard who wouldn't be in a job right now. Or ask the workers of Bifab who would not be in a job this Christmas without the intervention. Because while Richard Leonard was having wee photo shoots outside Bifab, I was actually making sure that we saved that company from administration and kept those workers in a job. So that that is real action to be compared with the empty rhetoric of Richard Leonard and the Scottish Labour Party. It seems Labour's promises are now empty rhetoric, designed to get their party back in power, regardless of the harm they do by agreeing with Tory policies. What makes this crystal clear are hundreds of statements made by different Labour politicians from 2014 up to the present. Alistair Darling made a chilling statement to the Better Together staffers during the last referendum. Just why to them? And the current Scottish Labour viewpoint has not changed. John McTernan recently said that he prefers anyone to the SNP. The days of Keir Hardy's Labour Party are gone. That party is no more. The future of Scotland needs to be in Scotland's hands. The party best able to deliver that future now is the SNP, which is acting in the best interests of Scots and Scotland to give us the power to define our own future. They should be supported, even if you are not a natural SNP supporter, because they will free us to set our own path forward. That path will bring us political parties in the future that are dedicated to our own needs, not those of the UK Parliament. Whichever ones they are, they will be untainted by links to Westminster. Scotland is a nation of proud people. We have always pulled together when we needed to. We have the opportunity now for people of all parties to stand together and claim our independence so that we can take our place in the world. Whichever parties we elect post-independence, it will be a Scottish party, dedicated to creating and upholding the Scotland we want, not a London-centric vision imposed by Westminster. Scotland's future created in Scotland. What a beautiful thought. Together, we can make it reality. Nay, mir will lure bonny gallant, merch to war when your braggarts cruelly grow. Nor we winds reap at heed and clachin, mourn the ships sailing down the broomy low. 
Broken families in lawns we've heriot. Well, car Scotland, the brave name, mere name, mere. Black and white until other married. Mag the vile barracks, so their masters bear. Say, come on. At him with freedom. Never heed what the hoodies croak for doom. In your house, so oh, the bairns, O oh, Adam, will find breed, barley bree, and painted room. When McLean meets with friends and spring burn. Oh, the roses and greens will turn to bloom, and the black lad Fiona Yanga dings the fell gallows o' the burghers' doom. <laughs>